Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Ryan Maves. I'm the chair of the CHESS Disaster Response and Global Health Section. Uh, we're going to be presenting today uh, Pick You in the MICU, Supporting Pediatric Care During Public Health Emergencies. Again, my name is Ryan Maves. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology in the sections of infectious diseases and critical care medicine at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It is my pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Mary King, who's a medical director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Harborview Medical Center, as well as pediatric, and, uh, excuse me, as a pediatric intensivist at Seattle Children's in Harborview. She is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle as well as by Dr. Deanna Behrens. Dr. Behrens is a pediatric intensivist at Advocate Children's Medical Group in Park Ridge, Illinois. So we're gonna be talking today about current public health emergencies affecting principally children, specifically respiratory syncytial virus and influenza. So of course, I think as we all know all too well, we are coming off the what some have called the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it wasn't that long ago, just a couple of years ago, where we all saw news reports like this. Texas Medical Center reaching 98% ICU capacity, border hospitals uh, near the, Tex uh, the Texas-Mexico border over, uh, overwhelmed with high numbers of critically ill patients. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, disaster declared in New York over fear of lack of ventilators. Um, now, Today, we find ourselves in a different situation. Looking back on the, again, the first two to three years of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that these waves and surges of the pandemic largely spared children. We do know from good observational data that COVID-19 is typically less severe in children. We also know that pediatric hospitals, particularly early in the pandemic, provided a lot of support to adults, adult ICUs. Uh, this happened by, for example, increasing age cutoffs for PICU admissions, so pediatric ICUs accepting adults up to the age of 26 in some cases, if not older on occasion. And in providing care to younger adults, we're able to offload much of the burden by hard hit medical and surgical intensive care units. And if we see, and if we look at this in terms of the actual rates of hospitalization across the United States by age group, see that the rate in November of 2022 of admission for children with COVID-19, and by defining children as anyone under the age of 18 years age, it's about 0.47 per 100,000 population. So really very, very low. But now let's take a look at where we're at with influenza, for example. In this same age group, rates of admission for children zero to four years is 9.3 uh, persons per 100,000 population. And even for those above the age of five, it's five per 100,000. So that is you know, up to 10 to 20 times greater than the rates of COVID admission, dramatically more so. And this is after two years of essentially no influenza. Uh, looking at RSV, uh, rates are even dramatically higher, where uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, and this is all data from uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we see that children under the age, between the ages of one to two, 40 per 100,000 hospitalized due to RSV. Not only is that a ton compared to both flu and to COVID-19, but it's also eight to 10 times greater than this same time of the year in November of 2019, three years ago, immediately prior to the pandemic. And what that's left us with is those same sorts of news reports that we saw at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, but this time talking about RSV and about children. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Deanna Behrens, who's going to talk to us about the clinical aspects of RSV management in the intensive care unit in children. Hi, so my name is Dr. Deanna Behrens, and I am a MedPeds intensivist in the Chicago area. I only do pediatric intensive care right now, but I remember in the adult surge, um, as Dr. Maves was saying, we were help taking care. We were helping to take care of the adult patients, and I did a series of webinars actually um, called "Mickey and the Pick You." <laughs> that it was the opposite of this. So I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about one of our most common admissions, which is RSV. So the first thing for RSV is that almost every child in the world is exposed to RSV by the age of two. And most often it's just viral URI symptoms, some runny nose, things like that. But in a third of patients, it can actually move to the lower respiratory tract and cause bronchiolitis or pneumonia. We know that about two to 3% of infants are hospitalized with RSV and up to 5% of children who are hospitalized are intubated. And in general, the smaller a child is, 
the more at risk they are for having severe disease. And it's just mechanics and physics. So when we think about resistance in a tube, resistance is proportionate to, you know, radius to the fourth power. So the smaller the child, the more likely you are to have an increased resistance. And it's kind of interesting because we look at, at least in our area, we think about having this virus appear in different months. So if you are in the Northern hemisphere and you're born in October or November, then when you are exposed to RSV, you're going to be pretty young and you're going to be more vulnerable because you have um, increased resistance in the tube and you have uh, poor respiratory mechanical reserve. Now, if you're born in something like May or June, then by the time you see your first RSV season, you might be bigger and stronger and do better with that. So that's in general, why, in part, why we see some severe or more severe disease with kids who are younger. One of the good things about RSV, though, is that it is self-limited. And there is a very low mortality rate in the United States, although worldwide it can have a large contribution to childhood mortality. However, it remains high resource use for the hospital, too. So I just wanted to go over a couple of the manifestations of RSV because as an adult physician or the adult physicians who this audience is for, you likely don't see RSV very much, especially for bronchiolitis. Um, you're more likely to see RSV with pneumonia or with triggering asthma infections, something like that. But for RSV, we know, again, severe RSV risk factors other than small age are prematurity, chronic lung disease of prematurity. And then there's certain types of hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, immunodeficiency states, some neurologic and neuromuscular conditions. And then there's some modifiable risk factors like low birth weight, maternal smoking, all those things like that. The reason that, so we do have a medication that we call Synergis, which is a monoclonal antibody that we give to infants with high risk but that's why we give those particular infants this particular antibody or the monoclonal antibody because they are at the highest risk for having severe outcomes with RSV. Oh, next slide. Sorry. So what are you, these kids going to look like? So often, like I said, it begins with an upper respiratory tract infection. So what happens is that they start to have, you know, rhinitis and cough, and all of this can lead to increased respiratory effort. And in a child, you're going to see things like they're breathing fast, they're breathing hard, they have crackles, um, they have inter or subcostal retractions. In the young infants, they might have grunting, flaring, or head bobbing. We also hear wheezing sometimes. And um, I know everyone has heard the term, all that wheezes is not asthma, because in this particular case, the reason that they're wheezing is that their airways are clogged up with mucus, and then they're also narrowed from some of the other um, mechanics of the RSV. It is common to have some degree of hypoxia in these kids. And it's important to know that especially in the youngest infants, sometimes their only presenting factor is apnea. So they might be brought to the emergency room just for apnea and without some of these other symptoms that we see sometimes. And sometimes these kids need advanced respiratory support for this. Interestingly, um, this year, and this is just anecdotal evidence, but I think that we're seeing more fever with this strain of RSV or with this um, population that's getting RSV, I should say. But in, I don't know, I don't know if Dr. King agrees, but in general, you can, you can have fever, you can't have fever. Um, it's e kind of either way. For children, really when they're sick with anything, but particularly when they're sick with RSV, they can be irritable, they can not want to eat or drink, um, they might not be as responsive as much. And so those are very common things. All of these things lead to things like dehydration. And um, the parents often think that they look lethargic or very somnolent when they bring them in. 
Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about bronchiolitis because this is a disease that typically affects very young children, typically ages two and younger. So it's a viral lower respiratory tract infection. As I said, the about a third of the upper respiratory tract infections goes down into lower respiratory tracts. So while we do talk most often about RSV, which in general is about 80%, of cases of bronchiolitis. We also see other, um, definitely see other viruses that can cause similar presentations. And to be honest, most of the time, it does not matter that much if we have RSV or enterovirus or parainfluenza. The caveat to that is if your community has high rates of influenza, that's something that we might want to know about and treat for because we do have a medication to help us treat influenza. And we don't have a medication that we regularly use to help us treat some of these other um, viruses. So just kind of going on, I'm gonna put it in words and then I'm gonna put it in pictures in the next slide, because if you're like me, you're a visual learner. But what happens is that after it infects the upper respiratory tract, it moves down and you get all kinds of things like this epithelial sloughing, a bunch of edema, a lot of mucus, like I can't emphasize how much mucus some of these tiny babies are able to produce. And that leads to that airway narrowing and obstruction. And as we talked about, that can lead to the wheezing that we hear. Um, additionally, they cough a lot. Um, they can breathe pretty fast. One of the things about the tachypnea is that sometimes they can breathe fast and they can work very hard to breathe. But this past respiratory season, I've also been seeing a lot of what we call like our comfortable tachypnic kids who are just sitting there breathing pretty fast, but it doesn't seem to bother them. They're smiling, they're looking at you, um, they're just breathing fast. From the adult side as well, if you have an adult who is breathing 60 or 70 times a minute, that's obviously a critical medical emergency. And you might have an infant who's breathing 60 or 70 times a minute who's like, cooing at you and looking at you. So keeping in mind the different vital signs that we expect for different age groups is one of our hallmarks of pediatrics. So they also can get distal air trapping that can cause hyperinflation, and then they can cause localized atelectasis. And with all of that, you can further get mismatch of um, ventilation and perfusion that can lead to that whole vicious cycle with further increased work of breathing and hypoxemia. So um, this one, I just wanted to show you kind of what a picture of what some of this looks like. And I wanted to point out that this is, these are not my slides. I did not come up with it. There is a fantastic website that um, I recommend to our residents and students quite often, and it's called Open Pediatrics. And I put that in our references at the end. And they have a couple of great videos that go over um, this kind of disease process. So you have um, all of what we said before, but you can kind of see how that airway plugging and pooled secretion can lead to um, different localized areas of atelectasis versus air trapping, which is the reason that I put that one in. So that's what's going on in all of their lower airways and the very distal airways. And that's what these infants are trying to overcome with all of the other stuff that they're doing by coughing all of that up, by wheezing, it's making them breathe harder and faster, all sorts of things like that. Okay. So one thing that is one of my pet peeves is this phrase, like if you look it up on the internet, it says it peaks by five days. Um, I put that in quotes because in my experience, once a child gets into the ICU, they do not peak at five days. Mm -hmm. That All bets are kind of off for that. The reason that I put that in there is that parents and some um, providers continue to say that. And then when a child is at five days, six days, seven days, eight days, and they're not getting better, the expectation is different than what the parent is seeing. And that can be really difficult for the parents to reconcile this when they have this magic number of five days that they're going to treat. Um, physical exam findings, of course, um, can be consistent with all of those things that we already talked about, 
But I, it's important to know that I could go in and listen and five minutes later, somebody else could go in and listen and they might sound different. Maybe the baby coughed, maybe the baby mobilized some of the mucus, maybe somebody came in and um, it, and suctioned them. And so you can have physical exam findings that change fairly frequently with these kids as well. I will say that the AAP um, has a lot of recommendations um, and has a very good article that I put in the reference section as well. It is a clinical diagnosis. So as I said, we don't have medications to take away many of these viruses. And so there's not a lot of point to viral diagnostic tests. And then the chest x-rays honestly are very rarely helpful for some of these kids. Um, but that being said, I will say in a lot of places, we still do chest x-rays and we still do the viral diagnostic tests. In part, it's for local hospital and um, regional cohorts to see like what the epidemiology is of some of these viral illnesses. But in general, in the average kid, you do not need these sorts of things to diagnose RSV. You can diagnose those clinically. So what are some of the goals that we have for these kids? So um, really, these are the goals. So supportive care. So as I said, it's a self-limited disease. And if we are able to support them through this, almost all babies do okay with this. Um, there is some debate or um, some correlation versus causation about children who have had severe RSV infections and asthma or other kind of respiratory things later in life. Um, but you don't have to worry about that as somebody who is considering taking care of a child during the acute phase of bronchiolitis. So for supportive care, what we mean is providing them oxygen or advanced oxygen support as needed, things like suctioning, making sure that they are getting some nutrition, which might mean a nasogastric tube, um, making sure that they are well hydrated. Because they are so tachypneic and they have a lot of secretions, it's very easy for these children to get dehydrated very quickly. And then we do not need them to have perfect oxygenation. So sometimes in the ICU, I will even accept goals of 88 and above for some of these babies. They also say the AAP will say that you do not have to put supplemental oxygen on at all for children who are saturating 90 and above. And for kids who are on the floor or sometimes in other places, you can even spot check their oxygen. Um, you don't necessarily have to do the continuous oxygen monitoring. Of course, once they get to the ICU, 100% of our kids are on that kind of monitoring. Okay. So some of the typical practices in the PICU, and I believe that we'll likely talk about this later in the discussion, would be high flow nasal cannula, which I know is being used in the adult side as well, but we use it um, in, in a different way in a child. We're not gonna put an infant on 20, 30, 40, 50 liters per minute of high flow. We typically max out at about two liters per kilo for these infants. Um, studies really don't bear increasing it beyond that. We do not necessarily know how much two liters per kilo translates to like a, you know, surrogate for PEEP or something like that. Um, so the next thing that we often do would be to put them on the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And we have a couple of different forms that we typically use in our ICU, but often we'd put them just on a straight um, NIV pressure control mode. I think that that's something that um, you don't do quite as often in the adult side, but I would often put them on like a rate of 30 or 40 and then put them on pressure control over PEEP, whatever oxygen they need to keep their saturations above my goal. And then that tends to help them with their work of breathing and with their tachypnea. Now, if you read the AAP guidelines on um, the bronchiolitis, they say that suctioning is controversial and some of them may or may not benefit from it. But I will say in our PICU, 100% of these kids, at least we try suction. And from clinically, from a clinical standpoint, we often see a great improvement after doing particularly deep suction. So we don't want to do it too often because you can have um, irritation and damage to the nasal mucosa. Um, but sometimes we can really help the child out by doing 
targeted deep suction, and then nasal suction as needed. Chest physiotherapy, we often do because these children may not be strong enough to cough on their own. And certainly we can't tell a little two week old infant, Hey, cough up your (laughs) cough up your mucus and get rid of that. So we have to do that for them. Um, Albuterol is also something that um, we don't use all that often in the ICU and the management of bronchiolitis. It is very tempting to do though, to do so though, because you hear wheezing, you think I have a medication that will treat wheezing. So let's try it. Um, We do often, or it's not uncommon to do a trial of albuterol, but if we do not see a improvement in the child, then we would not continue that. Of course, there's likely a certain subset of patients, you know, they come in And their mom, dad, brother, sister, grandma, and grandpa all have asthma, eczema, and allergies. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes that does work to help them. Um, But in general, I I probably use albuterol in maybe 20% of patients, if that. Uh, We do not recommend for the routine use of antibiotics. Um, One of the reasons that the AAP does not recommend getting routine chest x-rays as that the viral manifestations that we see, including the atelectasis, can often resemble pneumonia on a chest X-ray. Um, but if we know that most often, if they have RSV with fever, with all of that stuff, that it is due to the virus. I will say the caveat to that is a child who gets intubated for RSV because they can sometimes develop a co-infection. Another thing that I should have mentioned earlier is that we are um, seeing a large number of kids who have more than one virus. So they might have RSV, influenza, adeno, they might have whatever combination of um, viruses you can think of out there, and that can contribute to their increased work of breathing as well. And then we talked about feeding them. So When we think about feeding them when they have the high flow or the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in there, it's um, usually done through a nasal gastric tube so that they can get hydration, they can get calories. We do not want these infants, who some of whom are very, very young, to fall behind on gaining weight and reaching some of their milestones for weight. Okay. So for intubation and mechanical ventilation, so as we've talked about some of the lung abnormalities in RSV bronchiolitis, you can get hyperinflation, impaired minute ventilation, impaired VQ mismatch, and an increase in physiologic dead space. So none of that or very little of that goes away when you intubate these kids. Sometimes you have to do that, but um, I honestly try a lot of other things before I would intubate a child. Now, when to intubate, so this, um, these numbers were taken from a report done by uh, Dr. Tasker in the, you know, four or five years ago and an article that is reviewing RSV. Um, and I agree with waiting to intubate, of course, sorry, let me back up on that, sorry. I would intubate if a child, especially a young infant, obviously had apnea that's persistent, that's not responsive to high flow or non-invasive with hypoxemia and acidosis, I probably would intubate maybe a little bit earlier if they had altered mental status and a low oxygenation um, with a, you know, FiO2 above 0.6. But it is reasonable to watch these children longer than you might watch an adult with similar respiratory um, deficiencies. And again, that's because it is a self-limited disease. And a lot of times these infants, um, once we intubate them, you have all of the same problems that you had before you intubated them. And now they're breathing through an even smaller tube that you've artificially created by putting in a smaller airway. Okay. So some ventilation strategies. So I will say that when I do intubate or when I do place a child on non-invasive, A lot of this is done just at the bedside, seeing what this child responds to as you would do for an adult as well. But in general, I'll probably start depending on the age and size of the child at a respiratory rate around 30 to 50, at a tidal volume around six to eight, at a peep around five to 10, depending on what their degree of hypoxemia is. 
And in general, I try to keep their goal peak pressures obviously as low as possible. Um, but if they start to get above the 30s, um, above 30, 32, 34, whatever, um, I might consider a different form of oxygenation and ventilation like the oscillator. There's a little bit of... Um, well, let me rephrase. There is a lot of debate in the picky world about the use of the oscillator just in general and when to apply it. But in these particular infants, um, we consider it when their peak pressure is getting a little high. The other thing that I will say is we in the pediatric world do use the OI or the oxygenation index or oxygenation saturation index more so than I believe that you do in the adult world where you use the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So for those who are less familiar with the term, the oxygenation index, I always teach it to my residents is what you give over what you get. So you are giving an FiO2 and a mean airway pressure, and you are getting either a PaO2 or you're getting a oxygen saturation. So we look at those numbers and the higher the number, the more support that they are needing. And then like a lot of other respiratory disease processes, I will accept a lower pH in return for not having to escalate their, um, you know, not having to escalate their respiratory support to have high peak pressures and, um, and other non-desirable things. Okay. So I just wanted to put this up here. So I put in a plug for open pediatrics um, before, because I think it's a really great resource. It's free. It's available to anybody. I think you might have to sign up with your, you know, with your email, but they put together a list of videos on their YouTube channel that um, go through all kinds of things like your respiratory assessment for these child, all the way to bronchiolitis, uh, non-invasive ventilation comp, uh, concepts, uh, interpreting all of these different things. And so I think that these, this is a really good resource. If I could have just sat here and played some of these videos for you, rather than listen to me talking for the last 15 minutes, I probably would have, um, but I think this is an excellent resource. And then I think the next slide is my references, which we are putting in here, I'm putting in here so that if anybody does want to review this and come back and look at it later, um, the AAP has some excellent resources on that including the Red Book, of course, the CDC, and then the one that I referred to earlier, which was a, in 2013 by Dr. Tasker. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. King. I think I might've gone a little bit over my time, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about this. Not at all, Thank that you. was fantastic. Thank you so much. And just for those of you who are listening to this on audio, we'll see about including those references in the show notes as well. Um, so let me turn it over to Dr. Mary King, who will talk about uh, ways that public health um, emergencies affect pediatric care on a systems level and way that, ways that systems can support pediatric care in return. Thank you so much, Dr. Maves, and thank you, Chest, for having me today. Uh, now that uh, we've sufficiently raised everybody's blood pressure about taking care of babies with RSV, I'm here today to um, present our paper um, from my colleagues from the Mass Critical T Care Task Force um, from ACCP about how adult ICUs can help out um, our pediatric colleagues to take care of kids during public health emergencies. So we did publish this paper back in May of this year with some pretty clear first step guidelines of what adult ICUs could do to prepare. Um, so my goal today is to kind of go through this and give it a lens of how this could potentially apply during our current pediatric RSV search. So let's take one step back. Um, what are PICUs anyway? <laughs> well, uh, right now, um, there are only 6% of our total ICU beds. So we think about children as 25% of our total population, yet only 6% of our ICU beds are pediatric. And fortunately, that's because day to day, kids don't need as much critical care as adults do. Um, we take care of kids with congenital illness, prematurity, um, and 
uh, a slew of other interesting diagnoses. Uh, but we also take care of kids when they become critically ill with garden variety ICU problems like septic shock and pneumonia. Um, but fortunately, that happens in a pretty small scale day to day. Unfortunately, now what we're seeing is a large surge of pediatric patients um, in the setting of this large RSV surge. Um, we also know that these ICU resources are concentrated in urban areas. So a lot of outlying small rural communities don't have the same kind of access to these pediatric ICU resources um, as those that are in cities. Um, also, <laughs> something that's very true, uh, we just don't have as many pediatric healthcare workers. So whether it's pediatric nurses, pediatric RTs, or pediatric doctors, there's just fewer of these ICU resources. Um, and so it's not just about the beds, it's about the expertise and the comfort level to take care of these small children. Um, and then one last thing is just pediatric resources. So given kids are smaller, they do need some different supplies. And whether that comes to placing an airway um, or a central venous catheter, there are different supplies to think about. And that extends to medications and dosing as well. Um, so I guess the question is, given all these differences in care, um, how could adult ICUs potentially augment and treat kids in a surge where we might not have the capacity to take care of all these kids given our typical low numbers day to day. So let's go back a little bit. And Dr. Mays, you referred to this earlier, um, but during our first COVID surge, we had such a large surge of critically ill adults and an interesting lack of critically ill children. Um, that we had extra capacity in our pediatric systems and specifically in our pediatric ICU systems. Um, so that was a time where um, adult systems were overrun and pediatric ICUs stepped up to the plate to start admitting younger adults to pediatric ICUs to deliver care so adults could get that care and we could avoid crisis standards of care. Um, and we, the underlying concepts of respiratory failure shock and sepsis are very similar in older children and younger adults. Um, so at that time, back in 2020, um, many pediatric ICUs increased their age of admission to 26 years. Um, and we saw great, great outcomes actually from this. An adult hospitalist would support pediatric ICUs, often give consultation, but the PICUs pretty much ran these patients. Um, one area where there was extra focus was on invasive procedures. So sometimes adult providers would come in and, and provide some of that adult specific um, subspecialty expertise, especially in the area of procedures. So there was some partnering that needed to be done between adult and pediatric specialties to make it work. But what was great to see um, during that surge is that the teamwork that happened, we were able to make it, make it go. So um, given that we're in the inverse situation right now. We have an overabundance of pediatric ICU patients and a lack of pediatric ICU resources. Is there a way that we could actually do the reverse? Um, so that's the question. Um, I would say if, if we're gonna do that, we should focus on preserving the pediatric systems of care for those children that really depend on the unique skills and PICUs. So whether it's a size of a child being smaller or a child with more unique diagnoses and problems that are very specific to um, a pediatric center, those are some of the things that we sh should be cognizant of. And so when we're thinking about which children should go to pediatric centers and which might be more amenable to an adult ICU, those are some of the things we should take into account. Given these considerations, um, I had the good fortune to work with my colleagues at the Mass Critical Care Task Force from ACCP, um, and we convened a group of pediatric ICU and adult ICU docs together to come up with what we think would be the reasonable first steps to take um, when thinking about changing ages um, or sizes uh, for an adult ICU 
patient in the setting of a pediatric surge. And so we broke this down into conventional contingency. And then instead of crisis, we actually use this next term, critical clinical prioritization. Um, And so we're using these terms to think about, well, which tier are you in? How bad is your surge? And what might you need to expand your ages to? So in regular day in, day out care, Adult ICUs in conventional times take care of 18 years and older. And then they also just use typical ICU criteria. So as a first cut for contingency, we're recommending adult ICUs consider admitting patients 15 years and older, um, given that the equipment size medical dosing will generally be the same as in adults. Um, It's also consistent with our trauma system practices. So that would, and when you're considering age, 15 years and older would be the first place where we would consider expanding that adult ICU admission criteria. As a second step, if if resources are constrained to this degree, um, we would consider going down to 12 years of age and up, as well as over 40 kilos. And so we've included both an age and a size recommendation here because really at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to equipment level, uh, equipment size. Um, Kids that are 12 years and older are typically big enough that um, they're bigger than the Braslow system measurement cutoff um, and 40 kilos and up typically you can use adult dosing for medications. So this is why we've arrived at this second recommendation for a second contingency um, uh, age and size cutoff as that next level. One could apply these concepts to surge, to pediatric surge, even at lower levels. Um, And so we would prioritize when it comes to size, thinking about those older children as more appropriate for adult ICUs. And so this is the first couple steps that we've recommended as a way to think about that. One thing that's really important is that every hospital is going to be different. They're gonna have different MICU docs, different respiratory therapists, different nurses. And so it's important for each hospital during times of surge to have something like this in their um, emergency preparedness plan in terms of if you had to prepare for a surge for pediatric patients, what would be the steps you would take to do that? Um, So we recommend incorporating this in your emergency preparedness plan. Next slide, please. So let's take just a little deeper dive on equipments and supplies. So for kids that are greater than 12 or or equal to 12 and 40 kilos, um, typically the uh, equipment is adult size. So an endotracheal tube, 6.5 6.5 to 7 oak cuff tube. And typically you can use a seven French um, triple lumen central venous catheter. Um, so you really don't need new supplies to prepare for kids that are 12 years and up. We also have similar indications for mechanical ventilation and placement of these lines. We have similar strategies for volume resuscitation, management of shock, uh, we use norepinephrine as our initial vasopressor of choice. So many things that are actually similar between adult and pediatric critically ill patients. Um, and then lastly, we also follow ARDSNET criteria for um, acute lung injury um, and ERDS management. So again, um, these fundamentals remain very consistent between the, the two um, ICU practices. And so that's why choosing patients that that fall into some of these bread and butter categories would be a good first step. Next slide. So speaking of diagnoses, so this is not an exclusive list. This is really a list that we put together as a first pass. What would be potential diagnoses that are more suitable for an adult ICU setting? Um, So we included things like um, septic shock, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, post-organ transplantation, uh, DKA, trauma, um, COVID-19. Obviously, you guys are familiar with that. Um, And then even MIS-C 
Um, but you can see we've included diagnoses that adult ICU care providers really manage on a day in day out basis in some of those younger adult patients. We also made a list of diagnoses that we thought were probably less suitable for adult ICU settings. Those are pediatric patients with complex congenital heart disease, um, active pediatric malignancy that really require a pediatric oncologist, chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease that require a pediatric nephrologist, significant developmental delay that really requires a pediatric lens and approach and experience, and then some rare genetic diseases. Again, these lists are not um, comprehensive, um, but it's at least a first it's a first pass at how would we think about preparing for children? Which diagnoses should we start preparing for? Which ones maybe should we not worry about as much because that's really gonna be more appropriate for a pediatric center. Thank you, next slide. There are some other important differences. However, one absolutely needs to consider um, and we included these in our paper um, with really further discussion. Um, so one of the, important differences is just pediatric decision-making in general. It's a whole different process when um, you're getting consent from parents for children as compared to consenting a patient. That's one difference, but also there are nuances to patient visitation that are different. Um, having a parent at bedside actually improves the care of the child, many times makes it easier for staff. So we have to think about that a little bit differently, even in times of a viral surge. Also, family support is essential. And end-of-life challenges can be different as well for children. Um, and then lastly, and I touched on this a little bit before with some of the diagno diagnostic considerations, but pediatric subspecialty consultation needs absolutely are critical to consider when thinking about what patient might be better served in an adult ICU versus a pediatric ICU. Next slide. Um, this is one graphic that I borrowed from our manuscript in CHEST, um, which is really just a schema of what could an adult ICU team look like when taking care of a child. What we've done is we have a team led by an adult intensivist, but we've layered in a pediatric uh, ICU consult team, essentially, um, that could work via phone, telemed, or on-site intermitt intermittently. And so having an adult intensivist that has access to a pediatric intensivist would be important. Um, probably crucial as a pediatric pharmacist, especially if you're going to be admitting any children less than 40 kilos. Just the simple difference of what about my pump library? Is it ready to take care of a child less than 40 kilograms? If that's something you're thinking you're going to need to prepare for, that's going to take a pediatric pharmacist and a little time to do ahead of time. And then also a pediatric critical care nurse that could consult um, with the adult critical care nurse to provide some of that pediatric expertise that sometimes is, is, is hard to put down on paper. Next slide. So I want to touch a little bit on just how would one actually implement a plan to surge children into adult ICUs? And how would we do it at a regional level? Um, you know, a one-off call is one thing, but what if your pediatric ICUs are so overrun that maybe on a systems level, we need to think about how do we access those adult resources? So this is a great opportunity to explain um, one structure that really has developed from COVID and that's called the MOC or the Medical Operations Coordination Center. This came from some of the early experiences in Italy and then trickled into the United States as we started um, responding to COVID during our adult waves. <clears throat> so some regions and states have developed a mock in a way to level load the um, clinical burden so that not any one hospital gets to disproportionate amount of um, clinical burden so that it puts them into crisis. And the whole point here is to avoid anybody going into crisis standards of care. So if I were to uh, want to implement a shunting um, older children to adult ICs on a regional level, I would think about including both adults and children 
um, in a larger regional mock. So include those adult and pediatric resources in the same data input and bed allocation system. Um, in order to flex um, from adult to peds, as we did in our first wave of COVID, but then also potentially from peds to adults, as we could do right now during pediatric RSV search. And the goal here, as I stated, is to utilize all the resources maximally to avoid crisis standards of care for all patients. Next slide. So I was gonna give just one hot off the press example. Um, I'm fortunate to live in Washington state because here in Washington, um, my colleagues did develop a mock during our first adult COVID surge, and it's called the WMCC. That stands for Washington Medical Coordination Center. Um, and so that has been a collaboration between um, our DMCC with, uh, at Harborview Medical Center, as well as our um, healthcare coalitions and Washington DOH. Um, and that had buy-in from the entire state, all the hospitals in the state, so that if a hospital could not admit a patient and they had called a number of hospitals they would and been denied, they would call the WMCC who would work on placing the patient in an effort to level load. So Washington has just completed um, the process of integrating pediatrics into the WMCC during this RSV surge. And the key element that we've um, included in our mock um, is a pediatric SME that's embedded in the mock so that the nurses answering the line um, that are responding to these calls can access a, an advanced pediatric provider for any specific expertise questions. And so here in Washington, we're using a PICU attending to serve as the pediatric SME in our adult and pediatric mock. So the WMCC has gone live for pediatrics and it's now allocating beds to pediatric patients across West Washington state in an effort to level load. Um, and this is after a primary pediatric referral center declines a patient because they don't have a bed. Um, pediatric consultation is still managed remotely by that primary pediatric referral center while the WMCC locates a bed. Um, and the WMCC has that visibility of statewide adult and pediatric data. So they're placing children in both pediatric spaces as well as occasionally placing older children in some of those adult spaces as well. So in summary, there's actually more similarities than differences when it comes to taking care of a critically ill child. And adult ICUs are well equipped to handle some of the older children for some diagnoses. Um, we do need clear admission criteria and protocols. I advocate strongly for going to your emergency managers and to hospital leadership to try and come up with some clear criteria for your hospital given your current resources. The goal is to preserve effective care for all children. Um, and I also recommend considering a, a joint adult and pediatric mock um, to distribute ICU resources across our entire population to avoid crisis standards of care for all. And that allows flexing between both ICU uh, resources, both adult and pediatric in either direction for current surges, but also surges in the future. Just wanna say uh, thank you so much to my ACCP colleagues for all the work that we've done uh, together as a team, including pediatrics as part of the discussion has been critical to being at the table here to advocate for our children. Um, and so I just really appreciate it. I also really appreciate my colleagues at the WMCC who have really stepped up um, to lean into this problem of pediatric bed allocation. So thank you everybody for being here today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Mays for having me. Always a pleasure, and thank you both to you, uh, Dr. King, and to Dr. Behrens for being here. You know, we have some time just to discuss. This is obviously a very, you know, very complex problem that we're that we're looking at. And you know, I think coming, you know, I'm a I'm a, an adult intensivist, obviously, and my, you know, my 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 understanding of RSV outside of the immunocompromised transplant population is, I think, 
primitive at best is probably the, the best way to put it. And so, you know, I, I do recall there are some settings where there are specific antiviral therapies for for RSV. Can you think of any times, and I'm, if I could direct this to Dr. Behrens, where where you might consider utilizing some of the admittedly limited antivirals currently available? Sure. I will say that it's very, very uncommon for us to even consider using antivirals in this patient population, particularly in the young child with bronchiolitis. Um, there has been talk about using things like ribavirin. The AAP mm -hmm. and the Pediatric Critical Care Societies do not recommend that, except for in cases of children with severe immunodeficiencies. Um, I personally have actually never given that to a child. I don't know about you, Dr. King. Um, only in very select immunocompromised populations. So to me, that would not be a mainstay of RSV care. Yeah. We talk um, sometimes about, of course, like Synergis, which is a preventive um, monoclonal antibody that we give, like I talked about, to select infants, um, you know, premature congenital heart disease, some neuromuscular things, some um, congenital pulmonary issues. But in general, um, we that is one of the more frustrating things about taking care of these children the double-edged sword is that one, most of them, again, do well in the long run, but two, there's really nothing that I have to take away this suffering for the parents and for the child while they just have to work their way through this particular illness. I can't agree more. <laughs> yeah, well, well, thank you very much. Yeah, that that was certainly my impression. I, I, I will say when I'm, when I'm uh, Acting in my my non ICU job in uh, in transplant ID, that uh, uh, kind of a joke that uh, no no viral disease is considered totally untreatable until we've thrown ribavirin at it. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear your experience is the same, um, Doctor King. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I did interrupt. I wanted to bring up something because people might have seen it in the news lately, which is that there are trials for pregnant women for vaccines. Um, of course, these are not out just yet, but I think that that's very promising. Um, generally for the very, very small infants, because of some maternal protection from antibodies, we um, they're protected for a little while. So hopefully by doing something like this, we'll be able to further extend that protection. Yeah, I think the, the top line data for that just came out, although the paper is not published in phase three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so six months or so, about 75% uh, yeah. protection in the newborn with maternal vaccination, which is actually a very, I, mean, I think on some level, all all maternal vaccination is with, uh, is with uh, protecting both the mother and the infant uh, in mind, but a specific, specifically vaccinating the mom for an illness that is only likely to affect the, uh, to affect the child is a very, very interesting strategy for vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, it came up a lot for us in uh, kind of COVID vaccine land, the idea of vaccinating to protect others. And uh, when people ask, well, that's kind of unusual, I point out, well, that's the whole point of rubella vaccination. Um, that has a, a long, that concept has a long and proud history. Um, Dr. King, you know, we talked a lot about resource sharing and ways to kind of shift burdens around in health systems to minimize the impact on one particular hospital. And I think we know, at least in adult surges, that, uh, that overwhelmed ICUs uh, lead to increased mortality for patients with comparable illness burdens, right? That if you're at 150% ICU capacity, um, mortality just globally goes up. What, uh, you know, there are a lot of things in a lot of parts of the country that did better or worse than this. I think Washington State, and uh, as a, a proud graduate of the University of Washington, I'm happy to see that Washington is one of the states that did very well with this. If you had to pick like one big barrier, and I know this is an arbitrary question, right? Like what's the like what's the one thing wrong with X is always kind of a goofy question to answer. But if you had to pick like one first step to overcome in setting up a proper system of resource sharing, what do you think it might be? Well, um, I mean, I, you kind of alluded to it, Dr. Maves, and I think it's the first step of a multi-step process. Yeah. Um, I think the data sharing is essential. Um, 
because if you don't have situational awareness and that's what the data gives you, you, you have nothing. Yeah. You just don't know. Um, and the, the issue is you need to know what your neighbor's doing. <laughs> and if you don't know what your neighbor is doing, um, you're, you're going to be much less willing to help them out if you don't know how bad things are on the other side of the fence. And so you got to have the data, but you also have to have visibility of the data. So it's not just having the data live in a repertoire that some people at DOH have access to. It's actually having the hospitals that are part of the system, the leaders have visibility of this entire data set. So we all can see together what is going on in our backyards. Um, and I just think it's, it's really challenging just on a human level for anyone to really understand what they need to do in order out to help their neighbor. And so, you know, I think once you kind of break down those barriers or fences, I guess is my uh, analogy, um, then, then it gets, then you can start talking about, okay, now what are the challenges? And for me, that next word, that next challenge, it's actually a cultural barrier more than anything. So once yeah. we get the data, then we can start talking about, okay, we have these cultural differences and how we take care of patients or what we see as our role. You know, sometimes, sometimes folks just don't feel comfortable taking care of teenagers, right? And, and they just, they, they really just don't feel like that's part of their skill set. And so once they understand that there are kids potentially dying or getting care in a ICU care in a tent in a parking lot, their yeah. comfort level about their willingness to take care of a 15 year old, I bet you that's going to change. Yeah. And no, so I, I, I think, you know, it's hard to talk about all that as just one word because you need the data. Everyone's got to have the situational awareness. And that helps us with those cultural differences about how we approach our care. So for me, that that is everything. And mm -hmm. and you know, you guys did it really well during adult COVID. And I think it's it's time for pediatrics to to kind of step to the same plate. Well, and, and, and hopefully not have to repeat the errors that, that, that we made in adult critical care at the same time. For sure. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Behrens, you know, this is actually more sort of a meat and potatoes management strategy, and this is just to address my own ignorance. Uh, you know, you mentioned that albuterol seems to be a little bit unsuccessful. Are there any other airway management strategies that you find? I mean, not, I don't mean intubation airway management strategies, but if if airway obstruction is a major feature of the of the disease, and if I am an adult intensivist who's trying to help take care of a child with bad RSV, and albuterol, I'm just going to burn through it, or it's going to be ineffective. What what might I try? What would be a way I could handle some of the manage some of those secretions? You mentioned chest physiotherapy, obviously. Any other any other you know pro tips, as it were? Really, it's don't be afraid to suction. Uh, for these children, a lot of them do respond to it very well, but you have yeah. to go deep, and they hate it. So yeah. a lot of the children, when you're doing the chest physiotherapy tolerate that very well. And some of them, some of times it puts the babies to sleep. <laughs> it's like, you know, gentle. Um, and then you wake them up by trying to do the deep suctioning. Uh, people okay. have used things like nebulized saline, hypertonic saline, pulmazyme, all that sort of stuff. But it seems like from my experience and what the AAP recommends or talks about. Um, and again, even the AAP has said, you know, sometimes suctioning doesn't work because if you suction too much, you can lead to some damages as well. But um, doing suctioning as needed on a child who you can hear, you can hear them, <laughs> all the secretions pulling down yeah. there is extremely helpful. And then occasionally um, a very cheap and easy way to, uh, I often try just putting them on their stomach too. Uh, for a three kilo infant, it's very easy to prone them. And yeah. uh, it's not necessarily evidence-based, I have to say, 
but sometimes it helps them out too. And unlike in an adult where, you know, it takes, when I worked in the adult ICU, you know, they had literal teams of people going around <laughs> proning people because- Yeah, you know, those, those teams still exist. Kilos. Yes. Um, you know, it's easy to see for a child if you flip them over to see if that might help with the caveat that then you cannot get a very good view of what they are doing from their respiratory rate. Um, so occasionally I'll try that. And honestly, um, it sounds very simple, but sometimes encouraging parents to hold the kids um, is another way for them to both change the um, you know dynamics of how everything is distributed in the lungs by going from laying down to up, but also to provide comfort and support for them. And when you say suctioning, um, are we talking about just pharyngeal suctioning? Or are we talking like a cannula that's deep, going down in the yeah. trachea? Deep suctioning okay. down to the trachea. I mean, we also do a fair degree of nasopharyngeal suctioning as well, um, but we do a, a lot of deep suctioning too. Well, thank I you don't very know, much. Dr. King, if you have yeah, Dr. Mays, oh, this yeah. actually brings up an important point um, yeah. in that we're actually seeing a lot of toddlers during this surge with RSV, yeah. and that is very different than in prior years. Oh, really? And, you yeah. know, our yeah. best guess is that they don't have prior infections, so they're lacking immunity, whereas in past years, they have seen RSV prior, so this is a second or third infection, so it's less severe. So that's the hypothesis, and that's why we're seeing these kids with critical RSV that are now, you know, in that kind of 12 to 18 month range. We're getting a lot of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I would say the one <laughs> magic medicine for me, because those kids aren't little kids that you can necessarily um, flip on their stomach and they'll stay there. They're squirrely little toddlers. Um, yeah. And a lot of them are needing a little bit of non-invasive pressure and they get mad too and anxious. So I am using actually a, a good amount of dexmedetomidine oh, okay. in these children to tolerate some of the things we need to do for them, whether it's suctioning or some of the non-invasive therapies we're using. Oh, yeah, that's that's very a, we do that. We do exactly the same. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. And, well, and it's interesting because I think it's one of the things that's different about this pediatric search. It's pretty yeah. unique. Yeah, yeah. No, the immunologic impact. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I think you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find someone who was less in favor of public masking and, and social distancing measures than me. But I mean, you have to acknowledge there was a kind of an immunologic unintended consequence of that, which is that no one's seen flu for two to three years, no one's seen RSV for a couple of years and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that is super interesting. Um, so just a couple, just for both of you, in no particular order, any challenges with infection prevention on your units, just as a practical thing, if you don't, if you don't wish to discuss your own hospital, I understand, but have you heard of challenges with infection prevention and intrahospital transmission during the, with RSV? Has this been a challenge for you folks? Uh, I mean, they're all wearing, we're all wearing the blue gowns. For the, I mean, honestly, I assume 90% of our children right now have RSV. Another really interesting thing, and this is not exactly the question that you asked, but right now for us, our population is very, very young. So it's not like they're walking the hallways anyway. Um, yeah. So they're pretty contained. We are cohorting. So some of the, uh, you know, testing, the viral testing we do is really uh, to help us with our cohorting strategies. So yeah, yeah. that's been helpful. I would say in general, we're so used to masking right now in the setting of COVID, it's actually been easier to manage compared to prior. Yeah, it, it, it's it's funny. We had a uh, uh, a patient here in our hospital with meningococcal disease and there was a, a brief panicky moment when they, someone realized they hadn't put up the droplet precaution sign mm -hmm. until we realized that everyone is in droplet precautions all right. of the time, it didn't really yeah. matter anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one one last question, then we'll do uh, perhaps just a quick round the room. So and this is for Dr. King. You know, I, I think and we've both alluded to this. We've all alluded to this. The you know, the the shortcomings of disaster planning that we've seen in the context of, of the pandemic and, and the like. But, you know, looking back on it, are there any do you think there's any positive lessons from the way that we on the adult side 
responded to COVID that that are helpful for you, for you in pediatric critical care now? Anything? Did we do anything right that's helpful for you? <laughs> oh, you guys did many things right. Um, you know, obviously, and I've discussed this. I think the development of a mock is is a huge step forward, and part of me, I, so. Full disclosure, I'm the medical director of a pediatric trauma ICU. So yeah. trauma systems and disaster response is near and dear to my heart. So part of me wants to be able to respond to an MCI, right? Yeah. Um, and so having that infrastructure in place and that data in place um, is just a huge step forward for our disaster response. So whether it's for COVID surge or how do we adapt this to a fast moving disaster? So I'm super excited about that progress. And I'm even more excited as a PICU doc that PEDS is now becoming a, a part of that same construct. Um, you know, I think and one other concrete example, and this gets to um, the concept of, um, you know, we, we always thought about having a plan for crisis standards of care was the yeah. most important thing. Uh, we need a plan for crisis. What are we going to do? And that's when I say we, I talk about us disaster preparedness folks. Yeah. Um, and I think what I learned during the adult COVID surge is it's probably more important to have a plan for contingency. And, yeah. and so, you know, and that's not one plan. It's probably 10 plans in different levels of contingency. And yeah. we need a plan to do that. So we don't even have to get to crisis. Um, I think we were a little simplistic about it before. And now, you know, the concrete example I'd give is um, some of the uh, dialysis strategies that was used on the East Coast, how they would step down how much dialysis they would use on each patient based on how much resource was available and how many patients needed dialysis. And so they would look at it from a population lens. And, and it wasn't just do you get dialysis, yes or no. So I think just changing that paradigm and how we're thinking about disaster preparedness for me uh, is hugely valuable. And um, I, I hope we continue to take that forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I remember, you know, we were all discussing, you know, what was our triage plan going to be and how is our ventilator allocation going to work? And but a lot of those constructs are assuming you have a, a, a disaster that is limited in time and space, you know, an earthquake, uh, you know, a forest mm -hmm. fire, a thing, uh, God forbid, a mass shooting, a thing that is is geographically contained and and not realizing that it's very difficult to do triage critical care allocation when patients aren't coming all at once, they're coming sequentially. And that doesn't really permit the kind of allocation that we planned for. Um, gosh, well, I think we have a moment for quick uh, last I words. Can I say one real quick thing? Oh, Sorry. Um, I wanted to speak to the, I think that one of the things that I've seen both in the adult and the pediatric side during the thing is increased teamwork, mm -hmm. um, which has been really nice and not just teamwork in the hospitals, but like in our city where we have multiple ICUs, sharing resources, sharing knowledge, kind of like what you were talking about. If you don't have that data, like we had people literally say, well, if you don't have a bed, why don't you just call some more nurses in? Well, we don't have nurses to call them in. It's not just like that. Um, but by knowing which beds are available in the city and the hospitals being connected through that was great. Mm -hmm. I do want to give a shout out to people who maybe don't always get that recognition, like the transport teams who have done, at least for us, a lot of our coordination. And they get beat up all the time because outside hospitals are frustrated. They're scared. They're not used to taking care of kids. They're trying to call for beds. There's no beds available. And it's very easy to take that out on, you know, a nameless or a faceless voice on the phone. So they get a lot of, a lot of pushback. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to them as well. Oh, totally that, agree. that is a fantastic point. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, we, 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 we get very, very uh, ICU centric and forget about all the people who work so hard to make the ICU possible in the first place. So thank you.
Well, I think that sounds like the perfect place to stop right there with an expression of gratitude. And I would also like to add that expression of gratitude both to you, Dr. Behrens, and you, Dr. King, and of course, the great CHEST staff who helped pull all this together. So thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of CHEST, I'm Dr. Ryan Maves, and thank you again and stay safe. Thank you.